Hello and welcome to Women with Balls, where I, Katie Balls, talk to today's trailblazers. My guest today is a radical feminist, journalist and activist. Growing up in Darlington, she left school and home at 15 and moved to Leeds in search of, in her own words, scary-sounding feminists. As the years went on, her voice became stronger, fighting against male violence, prostitution and pornography. In the 90s, she co-founded Justice for Women, a law reform group which helps women who have been prosecuted for killing violent male partners. More recently, she has taken centre stage in the gender-critical debate amongst other radical feminists such as J.K. Rowling and Suzanne Moore. As a result, she has faced no platforming at several universities in the UK. My guest has authored a number of books, including Straight Expectations, The Pimping of Prostitution, and Feminism for Women, The Real Route to Liberation. She says, if men aren't threatened in any way by your feminism, then we're doing something wrong. My guest today is Judy Bindle. Judy, thank you for joining us today and for coming into the office, which we always love uh, for a guest. Um, on this podcast, we always tend to begin by asking, would you describe yours as a happy childhood? I mentioned in the beginning that you left um, home quite young. My childhood was very happy, but it wasn't without difficulties. And that was because we were raised in the northeast of England, which has usually almost always been ignored uh, by politicians and by those in the rest of the country in the UK. And my father worked extremely hard. He was a steel worker. He worked shifts. He worked extra shifts um, for money for the three children. Uh, and it was tough, gruelling work. My mum worked all the way throughout our childhoods. And we were quite hard up, but very well looked after, always had holidays. And our parents were extremely loving. My two brothers, one older, one younger, uh, we fought like cat and dog, of course, as you're supposed to. And life was sometimes hard. Um, So why did you decide to leave home so young? Well, I was bullied in school. I was identified as a lesbian before I'd really formulated what that meant. I had a crush on my best friend. And I suppose my puppy dog eyes and the fact that I wasn't interested in the boys at my school. Although if you'd met the boys at my school, you wouldn't have been interested in them. I think it was the best kind of lesson um, and teaching uh, of the lesbian faith possible going to my school. And so I was identified as a leser, as they called me. And I suppose there were two choices for the boys in my school. You were either a slag or a leser. And I came to realise that actually being a lesbian was way preferable than slogging them and more around the back of the bike sheds. So that led to me being seen as very different. And the girls were also scared because they'd been told that we were all sexual predators. And I was quite naughty in class because I was being bullied. And eventually I just thought, I'm not learning anything here. I loved English, I loved literature, I loved the written and spoken word. But I was failing at every other lesson and my school was terrible. So I just, for the last year of my official schooling, I didn't go in. And by the time I got to 16, the option was a job in a factory, which would then lead into marriage to a boy on the same council estate, a few kids that you couldn't really afford to raise, and a life of drudgery. And I decided there's more to life than this. And actually my mum, who was not in any way active in politics or feminism, was very forward thinking because her mum was. And she recognised that girls are left out, that she probably would have lived her life differently had she had the opportunities that she didn't have as a working class woman in the North East with no education. And so she didn't discourage me from flying the nest. And in fact, she gently encouraged me, despite the fact that it was a loss for her to lose her daughter, to lose that immediate relationship. She knew that I hated shopping, so that probably helped her not worry about me leaving her. I was never going to be doing that with her. 
Um, you mentioned uh, the North East being an area that traditionally, you know, governments and other groups um, have neglected. Were you quite politically aware growing up yet, um, then, given obviously what your mum was saying to you too? Or... Well, politically aware, probably no. My family were Labour voters, are Labour voters. And my dad was a union activist. And so he would talk a lot about the Tories and he'd talk a lot about... He wouldn't frame it like this, but it was obviously about class inequality, about the division between the North and the South. And my mum would obviously do the same. We saw class inequality everywhere we went. Just over the beck from where we lived on our housing estate, there was a place called Mowden, which is where the posh people lived. And there was literally a beck dividing it. And we used to occasionally cross the beck to go to the pub when we weren't allowed to, so age 15, to meet with the posh boys. And actually, um, one of the posh boys that I met during that time was the comedian now known as Vic Reeves. And, my God, they were miles apart. I mean, that was the longest mile in the northeast of England from my estate to where the posh ones lived. Now, you go and stay at your aunt's, I believe, uh, before you go to Leeds. Um, so b- what, while you're at your aunt's, that makes you then decide to actually go to Leeds, where I mentioned the introduction, you know, seeking out scary-sounding feminists, which as I say is your words rather than me saying feminists are scary. <laughs> well, I, I left home at 16 and went to live with my aunt in Harrogate, which is a blue rinse town, as we call it. So it was a Tory town. It was very different from Darlington. But my aunt lived on a housing estate. Um, good Betty's. And yeah, I mean, Betty's tea shops there, which is horrific. Um, as twee as you can imagine. And just the kind of place that really you would never, ever want to go to. And weirdly, in Harrogate, there was a gay bar. And I say weirdly because it just isn't the kind of town where you would expect that. So I went to the gay bar. Um met a couple of young gay lads who I befriended. And I also went to this campaign meeting and I met the out lesbian. There was one. I think she was from York. And through her I made friends with young women. I had no desire. I wasn't seeking a relationship. I wanted to meet friends. And in those days... Feminism and lesbianism were pretty indivisible. Many of the feminists were lesbians. And the lesbians embraced feminism because they saw that the treatment that they were receiving by bigots was to do with sexism. How dare women not um, want to be in a relationship with men? How dare they reject us sexually? So it was very, very enmeshed. And from there... I met my girlfriend and we moved together to Leeds, which was then really one of the hotspots of the scariest feminism that you have ever seen. It was full throttle feminism. There were women there who were picketing sex shops, sex cinemas, raging about the West Yorkshire police inadequacy to say the least in dealing with domestic violence that often ended up with women being murdered because they hadn't intervened but also significantly dealing with the fallout of Peter Sutcliffe who was known as the Yorkshire Ripper killing women with impunity and the police and the media together completely messing up due to we argued in our feminist group misogyny and the way that women are seen as either Worthy victims or worthless victims. And so it was within that context in 1979, at the very end, that I became involved in active feminism. And I was... What age was I? I was just 17. I was 17 and I was very young and I was about 15 years younger than everyone else. And so they mentored me and they talk to me about the history of women's liberation. They'd all been on the left. I hadn't been involved in any other politics. They told me which books to read, which I would kind of look at the first page and then look at the end page and pretend I'd read the whole lot. Yeah, the back of the book's usually quite good. <laughs> I learned very quickly how to do that. I still do that when I review books, that's a joke. 
<laughs> Commissioning editors. That was a joke. Um, I, I wondered on on that, um, wh- for listeners, what, what does active feminism look like? Because lots of people these days, you know, say, this is what a feminist looks like. Mm. So during that, and obviously there's different waves of feminism, and some people are very hyper aware and other people look at it and just not really sure what differentiates it. So I wonder if you talk us through what, what is active feminism in that period? Well, that's a really good question. And I think crucial to how we're operating today with feminism, much of it being online. And I have no issue whatsoever with women connecting and doing some activism online. I think it's, it's a real leveller and it means that women who live far apart from feminist hotspots can be involved but I'm talking about the keyboard warriors those that sit and think that sending a tweet means that you have just done something feminist and it's usually condemning a feminist actually in today's Orwellian world active feminism to me means that you don't just read about it talk about it do it in your nine to five job for which you are paid but that you also get onto the streets and are visible And go and demonstrate outside a court where yet another man is about to be found not guilty of murdering a woman because he uses the rough sex defence. Or lobby your MPs because they have supported a law that will result in material harm to women and girls. That you meet with women and talk about the reality of our lives under that very old-fashioned word, patriarchy still relevant today unfortunately I mean I will stop saying patriarchy when we're post patriarchy but for now it's quite helpful and so it has to mean that you do things that you contribute to a movement in whatever way is possible for you that ends in a or or moves towards material change and it can't just be thinking about it condemning other forms of politics or I suppose virtue signalling about what you think is acceptable or an acceptable way to do to do it. Do you think, and obviously there's lots of different ways we can define feminists, which is one of the issues, but do you think it is more acceptable to be a feminist in the way that you've been, uh, you know, has it become more acceptable back when you were in Leeds and it was scary sounding feminists or, or not? I mean, is the reaction you're receiving um, better... I suppose maybe right now is maybe in blocks of time we should take it rather than just immediately back then and right now. Well, something that's very apt at the moment when we look back at the suffragettes and we look back at those women um, who were very active out there campaigners and when we look at today is, I suppose a phrase that is very apt, is different century, same shit. So obviously things have moved on hugely thanks to feminist activists those that focus on male violence and how to end it and how to support women and not to blame women and girls when they're at the receiving end of male violence we have made huge strides you know it's embedded in law in culture in politics in every institution of this land it doesn't mean that we don't go one step forward two steps back because at the moment i think that we're living through a time of the most unbridled misogyny I have seen in over four decades of feminism, and I'll explain why. Um, You asked me how my feminism was received back in the very late 70s and throughout the 80s in Leeds, and how it is today. Well, back in the 1980s, there were unbridled sexists, and there were men's rights activists saying, feminists have gone too far, you bitches are responsible for divorce, for every social ill, you need to get back in your place. Then in the 1990s, there, were, there was the new, new kind of wave of sexists, which is men's rights activists that were received quite well by governmental departments, um, by the legal system, by representatives with influence. They would say, look, you know, we don't hate feminism. We think women deserve their rights. But men's rights are being eroded and we now can't see our children when we get divorced. The family courts are mean to us. We're not asked about how we suffer domestic abuse. I mean, she nagged me relentlessly. And where's the refuges for us? And then they talk about women abusing children way more than men. And they skewed the figures and they skewed the reality of women's lives. 
and our oppression, to make it as though they were the victims. We saw it with Fathers for Justice, Families Need Fathers. They would dress in superhero outfits and they would, you know, climb up tall buildings and shout about how women are divorcing them for no good reason and taking their children away. And then we reach where we are now, which is a state where men on the left who claim to be progressive, who've never liked feminism, because we challenge them about their use of pornography, about them joking about prostitution and brothels and how they fail to understand how when they sit on all male panels to talk about progressive issues, that that is wrong and unjust, that they're pushing women's voices out. So men on the left, largely, not all, but mainly, have always hated feminists like me. The feminists like me that challenge them directly. Not the fun feminists, not the fun feminists that kind of operate a kind of feminism light that men are never, ever threatened or challenged by. But feminists like me, they hate us. So now they can scream turf and bigot and Nazi and fascist because we are critical of extreme transgender ideology because we're critical of the phrase sex work and the normalization of systems of prostitution that abuse millions of women the women at the bottom of the pile all over the world they call us swerf sex work exclusionary radical feminist and turf which is trans exclusionary radical feminist and actually, I'm not going to say the word, but there's a four-letter word that they'd rather be calling us women. And TERF has substituted that. Now, I want to talk more about sex work and also, as you were as you saying, some of the criticism when it comes to trans issues. But just before we do you mentioned violence against women. And in 1990, you established uh, Justice for Women with your partner, um, Harriet and also Hilary McCollum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I wondered, could you just talk uh, listeners through why you did that and perhaps some of the most memorable cases so as to show, because clearly it played quite an important role in some of the things you're saying, which is the fact that things are not as bad as some of these issues. I moved to London in 1987 from Leeds and at that time I was very focused along with a group of, a disparate kind of group of, of feminist campaigners uh, against male violence on issues such as sexual assault and domestic violence and homicide. And there were men up in court, we sometimes would observe the trials from the public gallery, and these men were up in court um, for killing their wives because she nagged him or because she was allegedly unfaithful. And we came to name that the nagging and shagging defence because it was literally a get out of jail free card at that time judges would feel sympathy towards these men and often they'd get a non-custodial sentence for manslaughter at the same time there were women who had been convicted of murder for killing a man who was very abusive and violent and she'd killed him as a last resort because nobody had stepped in between him and the violence and her and there was one notorious case that we heard of, Sarah Thornton, who had killed her husband um, after he threatened to kill her child and had targeted her for abuse. But she was convicted of murder. And so we continued to publish newsletters, feminist newsletters, speak at meetings. This was pre-internet, of course, um, about these cases. And at the same time, we were also campaigning, along with other groups of women, to criminalise rape in marriage because it was completely legal to rape your wife. And this was outrageous. We knew that every woman who experienced domestic violence would also experience sexual assault, because a man that beats his wife on a regular basis is also going to have sex with her whenever he wants, and she's going to be too scared to say no. And many women didn't even know that rape in marriage um, was in any way rape, or that it was legal or illegal. They had no idea. It was part of the domestic abuse pattern. That law was changed in 1992 thanks to feminist efforts. And from then we, we realised that we needed to form an organisation that would bring us together and that would focus on several issues, but in particular the injustice of women as defendants in court who had tried to respond to male violence and ended up themselves being victimised not just from that violence, 
but by the criminal justice system. We were aware of cases such as Kiranjit Alawalia, who um, a group called South All Black Sisters, still going really strong, had campaigned for. She um, was an Asian woman who had killed her husband after the worst, worst 10 years of abuse. He would rape her in front of her children, um, torture her. There was no escape for her. She eventually killed him. Again, like Sarah Thornton, was convicted of murder and sent to prison for life. And we joined that campaign and eventually she was freed, as was Sarah Thornton. The courts understood, thanks to our campaigning efforts and public awareness raising, that these women were victims and should never have been uh, classed as murderers. And then there was Emma Humphreys, um, who contacted Justice for Women in the early 1990s, who had killed her pimp when she was just 16 years old. She'd had a lifetime of abuse by then. And he put her out on the streets, raped her. And... Uh, and she killed him and was in prison for seven years by the time she contacted us in 1992. And she was also eventually uh, freed on appeal. And the laws were changed to recognise what happened to these women. And also to draw the contrast between men like Joseph McGrail, who had killed his wife because she was nagging. He'd kicked her to death. And the judge said this woman would have tried the patience of a saint before giving him a non-custodial sentence. So that's why we started Justice for Women. Um, you mentioned the case of Sarah Thornton, and clearly prostitution has been a large part of your work. Um, but I, I wondered in the sense that you recently wrote uh, about your experience at York University, um, which is an experience you don't want to repeat, um, but for listeners, a uh, pretty hostile response to you speaking there. And part of that is to do with the trans debate, but it was also, I think you, uh, you know, some people saying, oh, there are sex workers at York University who choose to do that and uh, and so forth. And, and I wondered, is, in, is there an intergenerational, do you think, difference in how people view sex work these days? Because you have sites like OnlyFans and I've definitely found from conversations I have with, you know, people in their early 20s and then I'm a group who's probably, I'll still say early, early 30s, um, that, that is quite probably my my kind of peers will see it as a much more dangerous website, whereas the younger women I speak to will think it's actually much more liberating. There are hundreds of ways to be a feminist, but most of them are wrong. And and this is absolutely the case. Um, I'm not actually even joking. I don't mean that you have to sign up to a set of prescribed beliefs or ideals, but there is a basis to feminism, which is it's against the subjugation of women and against men's rights to abuse and dominate women, and it's for the liberation of all women. And some of these women who are calling themselves feminists are anti-feminist. So those that are arguing that sex work is regular work, that it's labour, it's a job like any other, um, it's the oldest profession, what they're doing is that they are ignoring the plight of the most disenfranchised women on the planet. There's a cohort of highly privileged women and men that identify themselves as sex workers who are atypical of the sex trade. And I know I've travelled the world looking at... I've been in legal brothels, illegal brothels, and everywhere in between. I've talked to pretty much everyone involved and hundreds of survivors of the sex trade, including those women that are still in the sex trade. And what you find is male entitlement that is off the scale, a view of women that is deeply disturbing and often grossly misogynistic. And so some of these tourists, as I call them, the highly privileged PhD, um, kind of white, highly articulate, highly educated women and men that speak for the sex trade as sex workers, um, dip in and out of it, doing bits of BDSM, bits of escorting here and there. And of course the woman who has a PhD, is highly privileged and educated, has a second home in the Cotswold, sends her kids to private school, has never been raped by a punter, has no alcohol and drug dependency because of the trauma, has been treated beautifully by her sweet-smelling, handsome Richard Gere clients. Of course she exists. Never met her. She will be there somewhere. So does the black British man in his 40s who's never, ever witnessed or heard of any racism. I'm sure he also exists. But they're atypical. 
And when I get accused of, of being whorephobic, I mean, talk about a tongue-twisting, ridiculous t- term to use against a feminist who campaigns to end abuse in the sex trade. What they're failing to see is that this is, this is actually critical of the men and the normalisation of sex buying of pimping. This is nothing to do with the right of a woman to do what she wishes with her body. I'm no threat to women who decide that they want to sell sex to earn a living. This is not the woman who is doing wrong in any way. It's the pimps, the brothel owners, the punters, those that normalise the most horrendous form of unbridled, cruel, sadistic capitalism that we have seen. And how men on the left, or women on the left, can defend such a gross industry that abuses women of colour, care leavers, sexually abused girls, poor girls and women all over the world, I fail to see. Um, You mentioned Richard Gere. I recently actually had Pretty Women come up in my uh, ear. Do you you think that film is dangerous, or, or people can just work out what they want from it? Well, Pretty Woman now is kind of... I look back on it with nostalgia in a way that I do the IRA now that we've got ISIS. You know, it's, yeah, at the time it was pretty dangerous. I remember going into a school, um, 16-year-old girls, 16, 17-year-old girls in Russia, in quite a poor area, talking about feminism, and half of the class wanted to be, as they put it, prostitutes when they left school they saw that they had no opportunities they've been told it was great I mean if you look at Julia Roberts and and her um, friends on the streets in that film how healthy does she look I mean this is not real life Richard Gere is not real life none of it is and ask yourself this about Pretty Woman it was a hugely successful film wasn't it it grossed millions and millions and millions It went all over the world. What usually happens with films that are that successful? Sequel? Pretty Woman 2? Where's Pretty Woman 2? There can't be Pretty Woman 2. Because by the time we get to Pretty Woman 2, he's called her a whore and kicked her out. He's taken her kids off her. And she's on drugs. And he's got some other woman. So none of it's real life. Um, now, you mentioned uh, earlier on about, obviously, the term turf and using inverted commas. Um, and obviously, we're, t- we're talking about York University a little bit, too. I wondered, I mean, if you're feeling as though you're facing, as as a group, greater... As, as scrutiny might even... As it's probably the wrong word, in a way. Uh, greater opposition, mm-hmm. threats. Um, there was recently a, a lunch that you wrote about for Unheard. <laughs> and I just wondered um, how... Do you, you mentioned how more people are actually, as a result of some of the hostility towards the movement, um, you're actually seeing more young women come out. And then I think there's also um, this lunch with J.K. Rowling and others. Is that how is that support group stronger than ever when you're faced with uh, you know lots of people arguing that you know you're an extremist? The issue is not about trans rights. We all support trans rights. Trans people have rights enshrined in law. Um, that's unquestionable. I'm a lesbian. I should know what discrimination feels like. This is about extreme gender ideology. The lesbians can have penises, male-bodied sex offenders should be in women's prisons. We should lose our sex-based rights. Um, This is an ideological battle, not a generational one. But many young women, and I hear from these young women all the time, they're bullied out of speaking about the feminism that they understand to be feminism. So the abuse of prostitution, the danger of trans ideology. And they're told by the beards in their LGBTQQIA, two-spirit plus groups, that usually lead those groups. Or their feminist societies, again, the beards run them, that they will be seen as swerfs and turfs if they dare to speak about male violence, effectively. That's what they're shutting down. That's what they shut down when they stop me going to universities. They hate the discussion about male violence. The trans thing is a kind of excuse. It just gives them a legitimate, they think, platform from which to deplatform me. Do you think your trans 
the position is mischaracterized. Totally yeah. mischaracterized. It's gender ideology that I oppose, and all of the feminists that I know. There are some anti-trans women, particularly in the States, who might call themselves feminist, but actually they're obsessed with this issue. For them, it's a single issue. They've never done any campaigning against male violence. Um, they, they're just they're anti-trans, they're anti um, lesbian and gay, they're often anti-abortion, and they're not our sisters, right? They are not feminist. Now, the lunch with Rowling and the other women, um, we're friends. Um, some of us have active friendships. I've known Joe Rowling for some time. Um, we actually talk about many things, connect in many ways as feminists. She's one of the funniest women that I know. Um, she's great fun, great company, and a truly decent and good person. Mischaracterised as evil, yada yada. Some of the other women who were there, brave women, Alison Bailey, Maya Forstater, who've taken cases in the public domain, which means that the emperor is stripped bare. For once, they can't do, like Stonewall and the trans activists can't do the whole no debate or empty chair us, or refuse to turn up to discuss this. They have been held to account by those women. Raquel Rosario Sanchez, she wasn't at the lunch, but she's someone that we all know, who again took her university to court. Um, Kathleen Stock, who was monstered out of her job as a philosophy professor. We've formed friendships and alliances. And that's really important, because that's the history of the women's liberation movement. No, a few very final questions. The first was just, um, when it comes to the main political parties, uh, you have a situation where I think the Tories more recently have found uh, their position on a woman's biology. Uh, I think Keir Starmer is still looking for his. Um, but you described the moment when Boris Johnson declared that biological males should not be allowed to compete in women's sport as the week Britain came to its senses. And, and I wondered, do you think um, that if this, if this currently holds in terms of what the main parties are saying, so um, some confusion on the Labour side, clear position choice, do you think you could see some unlikely perhaps... Um, feminist figures backing the Tories at the next election. Do you think it's a, a big enough issue to for people who I don't think you normally categorise as being on the right, if that makes sense? I hope not, because I think we shouldn't abandon the left. The left has abandoned us. The male left, the mainstream hard left. Um, and and I, I will never vote Tory. And I think feminism has to remain on the left. It doesn't have to be the hard left. The hard left is very bad for women. I'm grateful when whoever's in a position of power, whoever's prime minister or in government, speaks out. But obviously Boris Johnson had a lot less to lose than Keir Starmer thinks he does. I don't think that makes Boris Johnson a feminist. He certainly isn't. And I also think I wouldn't have chosen that headline when Britain came to its senses. Um, it came to its senses because we have been, feminists have been, banging on about this issue for a long time. Boris Johnson spoke out, which was great. Um, but where the rest of them? If you look at the state of the other parties, they're just in total and utter disarray over this issue because they don't understand feminism and they don't understand why we're challenging transgender ideology. But I think we will prevail and things are shifting in the right direction, definitely. Now, final two questions. Um, you clearly, uh, obviously, this is a life's work, um, but I wondered in that time, ha have, your, have any of your views or, or opinions changed over, over the past you know, few decades? Oh, definitely. My, my opinions grow and change, um, not necessarily dramatically, because I think the underlying basis, the building bricks of feminism, is ultimately right. You know, we are a sex class of women oppressed by a sex class of men. That doesn't mean all men oppress all women. It means that like for like, we're disadvantaged. Our views and politics change with each, um, what's the cliche bit of rich tapestry? That <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the journey of the destination. The journey. God, you haven't Enjoy said journey ride. once, thank God. <laughs> yeah, we need to get American accents. Or reached out. <laughs> I've reached out on this particular journey. Now, the final question we ask everyone on this podcast is simply, what is the worst advice you've ever been given? And you can, of course, have completely ignored it. The worst advice I've ever been given was thankfully advice I didn't take. But my God, did it put me through the mill, worrying about it and thinking about it. And that was after I wrote 
a piece in Guardian Weekend magazine in 2004, which was the first piece of mine that I'd written about the transgender issue that had gone online. So it was carnage out there. It was very critical of a trans a man who identified as a woman who had tried to close down one of the most important um, women's organisations in Canada called Vancouver Rape Relief. This person, this trans woman, had tied them up in litigation because they didn't want um, this trans woman to directly counsel rape victims. And it was the start of hell, of, of what turned out into 20 years of hell for this organisation. Anyway, I wrote this column in The Guardian. Um, all hell broke loose. And the reader's editor wrote his column on it. Um, Kath Viner, who was editor of Weekend magazine at the time, now editor of The Guardian, she defended and supported me. She'd commissioned the piece. And I was massively targeted. It was the beginning of you know, that for me. And I was advised by a senior journalist, keep your head down, don't speak of it, apologise, say that you went too far, because there was some cheeky humour in there, and just really stay away from this now. And I thought, no, no, absolutely not. I can't do that. I will apologise for my tone, but I absolutely will not capitulate and back down this is what feminists have been told to do for decades don't upset him don't be don't go too far when bill clinton was president and there were all the allegations about sexual impropriety including rape of a black woman against him there were some really really senior feminists in the states telling the more radical ones andrea dworkin who was a friend of mine don't kick off against Bill Clinton because he's about to give us millions of dollars for the End Violence Against Women programme, which will revolutionise the work that we're doing. And Andrea said, no, you do not capitulate. You stand your ground when it comes to issues like this. And I did stand my ground. And had I apologised and backed down at the time, things would have been way worse for me. Because they smell blood. They come after blood. And this is a cruel, sadistic movement. And so they don't want your apology. They don't accept your apology. They see it as weakness. And you're in for way worse. So thank God I didn't take that advice. Thank you, Julie. 